Hello, and welcome to the School of Oceanography and the Marine Sciences. I'm Dr. Randy Bundy, and I'm an assistant professor of oceanography. I'm a marine chemist, and I study the chemistry of our oceans and our coastal waters. I focus specifically on metals such as iron and copper, and I study how they cycle and how they impact marine organisms. Some of this research involves understanding metal pollution in the environment, such as in our local Puget Sound waters. Today, I'm going to talk to you about another kind of pollution, plastic pollution. Myself and my co-instructor, Rick Kyle, discuss plastic pollution in our marine pollution class, along with many other types of pollution. So today I'm going to explain to you how plastics get into our oceans, how they impact marine organisms, and how we sample for plastics to determine where in the ocean we're going. And hopefully all of this will help us learn more about plastics so that we can know how to remediate plastic pollution in the marine environment. Plastics pollution has touched every corner of our earth, including the remote Arctic Ocean, the bottom of the Marianas Trench, the top of Mount Everest, and even in marine protected areas. 280 million tons of plastic are produced globally each year, and this is equivalent to about 140 million elephants worth of plastic that's produced every year. About a third of this plastic is for single use items like coffee cups, straws, plastic bags, and plastics are the fastest growing component of municipal waste, about 60% of the total. So how do these plastics get into the ocean? Well, a lot of this plastic gets dropped on the ground and makes it into rivers or runoff and ends up in the ocean. In fact, 80% of the plastic that's found in the ocean comes directly from shore, and only about 10% is dropped directly from fishing vessels or commercial shipping vessels. Up to 10,000 shipping containers are lost at sea every year, and all of the goods that are being transported in these containers end up in the ocean. For example, in 1992, 28,000 rubber ducky bath toys were lost at sea in the North Pacific, and these bath toys have been found on countless beaches and shores throughout the global ocean as they're transported by ocean currents, ranging from coastal Alaska to the tropical South Pacific and even the eastern coast of the United States. Plastics are not biodegradable, and so therefore they'll never break down in the marine environment, and instead they simply only break down into smaller and smaller pieces over time. Plastics can have a myriad of impacts on marine organisms. Large plastic items can cause entanglement and smaller pieces may be ingested by seabirds or fish or mammals or even coral polyps. These plastics also tend to absorb other pollutants like organic pollutants such as pesticides. So they can also act to concentrate other pollutants in the marine environment. The vast majority of the plastic in the ocean is actually not large pieces like the fishing net that we see here However, it's actually what we call microplastics. And these plastics range from about the size of a tip of a pin to about the size of a pencil eraser. And these microplastics are made up of a bunch of different things. Um, they include nurdles, which are small plastic beads that are used in industrial plastics manufacturing. There also can be some of these broken down pieces of larger plastic items that have broken into smaller and smaller pieces, and even fibers that shed off of our clothes or that go into the washing machine as we wash our clothes, and these get washed into streams and rivers and also end up in our waterways. These small plastics have really long lifetimes and they're transported from where they're released close to shore to the center of the ocean gyres. The ocean currents create a circular circulation pattern and in the middle of each ocean basin, this accumulates plastics over time since they do not break down. About 0.1% of all the plastic that's produced on land ultimately makes it into the ocean. And I know this doesn't sound like a lot, but this actually represents more than 5 billion pieces of plastic. So eventually some of this plastic may become small enough that it's lost to ocean sediments, it gets ingested by organisms, or it ends up on a beach, or it gets transported elsewhere. Currently, the way that we sample for plastics in the ocean is we usually drag nets at the surface of the ocean to scoop up and concentrate these microplastics, and then we count these plastics using a microscope or we examine their optical properties. So despite the fact that plastic production on land has been increasing almost exponentially though over the past several decades, we, we haven't seen a corresponding increase in the amount of plastic that has accumulated in the ocean. So one of the big questions in this field is where is all this plastic going and how can we clean it up if we don't know exactly where it's going once it reaches the ocean? 
So to answer this, I'm gonna do a quick demo in one of our labs that we have here in the marine sciences um, area of our campus. And I'm gonna show you a little bit about what happens to plastics once they get into the ocean. Okay, now that we learned a little bit about plastics and what they're doing when they get into the ocean, we're gonna look at a little demonstration that kind of mimics where plastics go when they get introduced into the ocean from shore. And so what we have here is a simulated ocean with a couple different density layers of water. And the ocean has these kind of different layered structures of the water masses because the water has different temperatures and salinities. And so that causes them to have different densities. So they kind of stack up in different layers. So we're simulating a very simple ocean here with basically just two layers and kind of a mixing layer in between. So on the top, we have a less dense seawater layer that's in yellow. And then on the bottom, we have a more dense blue layer. And then you can see a little bit of green in between where they've mixed slightly. So we have approximately three layers now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce a few different types of plastics to our simulated ocean. And these are gonna be some of the more common types of plastics that we find in the ocean. And then we'll see kind of where they fall based on their different properties. So the types of plastics we're gonna use are some PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride. That's one of the common types of plastics that we can find in the ocean. This is similar to types of plastic that make anything pretty rigid, like some rigid pipes. Um, then we're gonna put in some different types of polystyrene. Um, this is similar to styrofoam, so packing peanuts, um, some other like takeout containers as well that are kind of flexible and have a lot of air in them, but some of them have different additives. So we'll see how these two different ones behave. And then finally, we have some polyethylene, which is a really common type and we have a high density and a low density polyethylene. So these are all of the very common types of plastic that you might find in the ocean when you're sampling for them. So let's just put some of them in here. Let's start with some of our polyethylenes. So the high density and the low density. Okay, so those ones are seeming to kind of just float on the top layer. And then here we have our polyvinyl chloride. Um, those are a little bit more dense. This one has a little bit of air in it just based on how it looks. So we'll see if I just give it a little tap. That one sinks <laughs> as well. A little bit more slowly, so it has a slightly different property than that um, other PVC. And then this is um, the polystyrene, which is similar to styrofoam. And these are both a little different ones. So you can see they're, they kind of have this um, medium density in between our two layers. So they're starting to kind of hang out. Eventually that other one is sinking because it has a few different additives in it. So this is just looking at a very simple property of these plastics, their density, but in reality, they're complex organic molecules. So they all have really different chemistries and other properties. And so this just kind of highlights that I was explaining in the lecture when we sample for plastics in the ocean, we generally sample only at the surface because a lot of the common plastics are much less dense than seawater. So they tend to float like these polyethylenes here. However, if we looked at a bunch of different types of kind of common plastics that we use in our everyday life, we can see that they have different densities. So a lot of the plastics, we might be missing them by simply sampling really close to the surface. And researchers have only really just begun to start trying to sample for microplastics below the surface, and they're finding some really interesting things. And many of the plastics that we haven't seen accumulate in the gyres might be resting just below the surface or even a little bit deeper in the water column. So I just showed you from our demo that actually some of the plastic may be actually sinking in the ocean, which explains some of the observations of plastic pollution in deep ocean, ocean trenches and also explains why we haven't really seen an accumulation of plastics in the gyres over time at the same rate that plastic production on land has been increasing. Um, and as you may have seen in our demonstration, plastics are all different. They have different chemical properties, different densities, and they behave differently when they're released into the ocean. And so that makes cleaning up plastic in the ocean a formidable task and ongoing research will help us to kind of resolve this and how to best clean up ocean plastics. Several ocean cleanup projects are currently underway. Um, and one in particular is targeting the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the North Pacific Ocean. Um, you may have heard of this garbage patch, but it's not exactly what you think. The plastics here are actually barely visible to the naked eye. And in fact, as we saw in this presentation, there's a much higher density of plastic in this region compared to where it's released, such as in the coastal regions. 
Um, so these cleanup efforts are really promising. However, they still remain pretty expensive. And right now, plastic pollution prevention is actually the best way to currently remediate plastic pollution. And efforts such as those recently passed in our Washington state legislature um, are meant to limit single use plastic production by the restaurant industry and other industries, and also to promote the production of biodegradable plastics. And these are very exciting and promising developments that hopefully other states will begin to follow. I hope to see many more of you in my marine pollution class in future quarters so that we can start to train the future oceanographers that can help us solve this marine plastics pollution problem. Thank you.